Forgiving in Magic The Meaning of Forgiving Magic Point of View Does forgiving cause a loss in existential volume? How to get it back? The existential volume. Yes, there is a loss of it. What is forgiving? It is for giving. Giving for someone. Nullifying the offense. Someone has offended me, has assaulted me in my rights. I lost the given right. As a consequence, by forgiving the offender, I forgive him the inflicted offense. And your rights get cancelled too. Doing so, I tell the world, look, this right I have earned by working on it for 30 years, as did my ancestors, it's worthless. I'm forgiving him. I, the generous one. In this sense, we greatly nullify our existential volume. Whereas the one who has been forgiven, respectively, receives this volume literally for free. And as strange as that might seem, his value in the eyes of the world increases. The offender becomes more entitled to these rights than the one that has been offended. And the first question that arises, a very logical one, what is that for a strange Christian commandment? To forgive, non-resistance, turn the one cheek, turn the other cheek. Let us start with the fact that no one amongst the Christians has read the Bible. Sincerely, with the hands on your heart, who has read the New Testament? No one. Same with the Old Testament. Therefore, there is no guarantee that that is the way it's written there, especially considering that it was initially translated from Aramaic, then to Greek, from Greek to Latin, and then from Latin to all other languages. Inaccuracies are possible. And whether this is what's written there or not, you cannot know for certain. You can only trust the popes that instill these commandments into you. And that's not really what's written in there. The fact that popes lie is also part of the game. The gullible sheep will not double-check the information. But there are also distrusting sheep, such as Leo Tolstoy. He was a distrusting sheep. This is also what later caused the church to excommunicate him. And he had read the Bible quite carefully. A boring writer. Extremely hated by all of us already since school time, but nonetheless a must in terms of reading. Therefore, read his books on religion. The Gospel in Brief. If you want to have a good idea of the Bible without reading it yourself. At least the Gospel in Brief from Leo Tolstoy. He undertakes a very detailed analysis of the commandments. With that typical punctilious language of his. But such was the value of the cause. There is one more good writer, Nicol Morris. A student of Uspensky, Gurdjieff's associate, a very competent fellow, who similarly would take New Testament parables and translate them into the language of reason. His version is easier and more interesting. I especially recommend his book The Mark. A wonderful book, very good. It's for sale, you can find it on the internet. It isn't forbidden. Be sure to read it if it's a topic of your interest. <coughs> this is why these commandments, that are never evaluated by the person, that aren't questioned but taken for face value, are commandments that are meant for sheep. And it's precisely sheep that should give up their rights voluntarily. The situation tells us that if you are lacking critical thinking, it means you have no rights for any rights. If you cannot look at a situation in a critical way, if you're not capable of checking the information and unable to let it pass through your consciousness, therefore you don't need any rights. You'll be forgiving and giving them away. Whereas those who did read books, and not only, 
the aforementioned ones, those who didn't limit their life by the Bible, and have read other sacred writings, as well as their different interpretations, and have found the strength to compare them to one another, they understood that it isn't all as easy as it seems. Because forgiveness, as a way for an annulment, can be possible in very rare cases, and not everyone can afford to grant forgiveness. And while forgiving an offender for the inflicted offense, an intelligent person will ask herself what is it that she will get in return for this forgiveness. It's clear that from the point of view of a faithful Christian, this issue would never be addressed this way. But someone who knows what she'll be getting in return and what she'll be losing would never carelessly approach the issue of forgiving any inflicted offenses. Once again, it is that same inflated spirituality topic that has been imported to us from the West. Forgive your enemies, trust in God as He is your Father, your God will give you everything you need, ask for more and forgive your evildoers in the meantime. Who can possibly produce with such commandments? Encouraged idiots. Exactly. Beware of people like that. My dear students, since fate has brought you to my school, it means that you have to know this. Beware of such people. Beware. These are the most frightening of all people. Brainless people who live solely based on emotions, emotionally anxious, not thinking at all. Sheep. Let them live in their herd and graze on their pasture. They can trample you into the ground, so God forbid. This is also a natural selection, whether you will be able to overcome such a simple worldview, trusting in God, living for the sake of self in the name of your pleasure. Or would you rather deny such a point of view and attempt to live your life in some other extraordinary original way? A way that will be nice to remember and embarrassing to talk about with your children. Excuse me, one more question. How do you retrieve your rights if you have forgiven something? Well, well, yes. Where was my head at? On the pillow. How to retrieve it? In general, in most cases, it is an irreversible process. What do you think? Why did the Christians organize forgiveness, Shrove Sunday? Repeating their sacred sentence, God will forgive. All yearly deeds, including all unconstructive and unobjective acts of forgiving, are at this moment transferred to another jurisdiction for you not to have any access to this process any longer. The so-called Christian point of no return. All the ritualistic festivities that a Christian necessarily goes through in order not to have the possibility to change them. There are magic methods. Just remember that if you have forgiven a violation of your rights, and suddenly have decided that you would like to get them back, you have to remember that it can be and very possibly is that you missed your time to do so. Especially if it happened a long time ago, especially if you're a Christian, especially if you have said the words God will forgive on the ritualistic day of the Forgiveness Sunday. And now, asking for that back would be like… I don't know, like making a present to a close friend and then saying, you know, I changed my mind, give it back. He could, in other words, boldly send you to hell and thereby be completely in his right. But if you think that you're right, indeed, then get ready to pay. You did invest time in order to acquire these rights. Respectively, you've given away the rights together with the value of that time. And in order to get these rights back, you will have to start from scratch in many ways. The first way to retrieve your rights is 
leveling up to a higher caste than that of the person you have given them away to. Then you will have the right to request a refund. For example, you've given away your rights for money while finding yourself in the merchant caste. In order to claim back this right for money, you have to grow to the warrior caste. In other words, you'd have to pass a series of quests in order to… Uh, I apologize for using this term, because it really shows better than any other term the process we're going through here. Pass a series of quests and get to the state of a warrior. And once you find yourself to be in the position of a more significant consciousness, that is when you may request your rights back. The second method would be to lead the person you've given your rights to a situation where they will voluntarily give you your rights back. But this is a master level, and it's called manipulation of consciousness. The third way would be to find a force that will compensate you for these rights, not by taking it away from that other individual, but receiving them from the force directly. I mean a connection to a deity, by taking certain vows, certain geishas, and oaths that the deity will require. It gives you your rights back, and you start to slowly work them off by fulfilling the geishas, fulfilling the vows according to the conditions of the deity, that is, restoring your rights. There are different ways. Each single case should be looked at separately, because there are really no universal cases. And in every single case, there will be one method that proves to be more effective than another. If you'll be studying in my school, you'll slowly master the main aspects of work. Won't say all of them, but the main working, main effective methods. But remember, nothing is ever for free, and this I want you to know. God loves me, therefore he owes me, this is not our way. Believe me, even God never gives anything this way. And just as parents hope that the child will repay them for today's love and kindness in their old age through care and attention, so a person wrongly professing the principle of God loves me, therefore owes me, has to remember that if he considers God as his father, then he has to treat him as such, care for him, protect him, feed him, and water him and fulfill his whims when he gets very old. But the human consciousness, being childish by nature, thinks that since mom and dad are present, since they love me, they will do so forever, and nothing will ever change in our relationship. This is silly. Therefore, when you agree to a deal, you should know all the cards up front. And be aware that if today you're getting something that you understand you didn't deserve, then tomorrow you will necessarily have to pay it off. Ask what the price is.